So Blair is a communications and society fellow with the Aspen Institute, uh, which he joined following the release of the massive national broadband plan uh, by the FCC, which was the work product of the Omnibus Broadband Initiative for which Blair served as executive director. Uh, Blair had a previous stint at the FCC in the 90s as chief of staff to Chairman Reed Hunt, uh, and then he spent eight years as a principal telecom media and tech regulatory and strategy analyst for the research for teams at Leg Mason and later Stiefel Nicholas. Uh, in November, Blair and Reed published this ebook. This is not an ebook, this is a, this is a galley, <laughs> but it's available, Blair tells me, in every um, ebook format uh, in the marketplace. Uh, the book is called The Politics of Abundance How Technology Can Fix the Budget, Revive the American Dream, and Establish Obama's Legacy. And it offers a series of potential initiatives to capitalize on the power of the internet to drive economic growth and jobs. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce Blair Lewin. Thank you very much, Joe. <clears throat> and, and for those of you who thought that the 400-page broadband plan was massive, I can only tell you that the first draft two months earlier was 1,200 pages. Um, so I'm very grateful to a team that did a lot of editing. Uh, fortunately, we don't have, Reed and I didn't have that problem with this book, which is rather thin and, and deservedly so, I might add. Um, because it best really talks about a couple of core ideas that grew out of discussions Reed and I have been having over the years. Both of us have spent most of uh, kind of our professional time dealing with uh, technology companies who always seem to be focusing on how do we make things faster, cheaper, better. But we spend also our time in Washington, D.C., and over the summer it became clear that the post-election debate would be about uh, raising uh, revenues and uh, cutting benefits. Uh, or in other words, instead of faster, cheaper, better, it would be how do we do less more expensively. And we thought that that was not actually a very um, happy paradigm to be operating in. And we started to think about what have we learned in our own experience that might uh, change the way we think about it and offer a different path forward. Um, the principal reason we're talking about revenues and cutting spending is because we want to get the debt to GDP ratio in line. Um, but what there is a, actually a consensus about from Paul Krugman to George Bush's institute is that growth is far better, is the, is the preferred path to do that. It will do it better and more uh, sustainably. A second thing there should be no controversy about is that growth fundamentally comes from tech. Indeed, if you look at the 1987 um, uh, Nobel Prize lecture by Professor Solo, who received the award, um, he's pointed to a number of studies concluding that seven-eighths of the economic growth over a couple hundred years could be attributed to technological change and that technology remains the dominant engine of growth. And if one wants a serious look at that, I urge you to read Rob Atkinson's book, uh, Innovation Economics, which came out uh, in September and does a wonderful job of talking about technology, um, innovation, and growth. We also, Reed and I personally saw this in the 90s. I'm not saying we invented the internet or invented the wireless industry. I'm just saying we personally saw it in the 90s when we were at the FCC, a period of time during which the private sector uh, invested about a trillion dollars, uh, most of it after the 96 Act. Um, and in many unexpected ways, uh, certainly the budget estimates were all off in part because there was so much economic growth uh, attributable to what uh, growth in wireless and growth in the internet did. Uh, in that time. So the question we were trying to grapple with was, is there a similar opportunity now? Is there an opportunity, can we look at a sector that is big but capable of being much bigger, where private investment is sitting on the sidelines, where productivity gains in, in that sector not only drives growth in that sector, but growth, pro, drives growth uh, throughout the entire economy, uh, and also where government has appropriate levers uh, to unleash largely private investment. And we think that there are two. One is the power platform, which Reed was principally responsible for writing about. He's doing a lot of work in energy. And the other is the, uh, what we call the knowledge platform, or those things which are both we think of as the internet, but mostly right on top of the internet. Now, I'm not going to go into the argument because, in fact, A, Alan Davidson already made the argument, um, and B, I suspect everyone in the room already agrees with the argument, so I don't want to engage in preaching to the choir. I will simply note that while all the things Alan said are true, the areas that are lagging furthest behind, and I'm sure Grover has an explanation for this that I would agree with in part and disagree with in part, are areas that are characterized by very large government invo uh, involvement. So in for the education, healthcare, public safety, uh, and government services are laggards when it comes to the utilization of this kind of technology. And the ironic thing is 
The technology is primarily useful for the exchange of information or, um, or what we call knowledge work. Education is 100% about knowledge work. Healthcare is actually about 100%, except for you know certain kinds of surgery. It's almost all about knowledge work, and yet those are sectors which really lag. And there are a lot of reasons that they lag. And so the book details some macro things and some micro things. I'm just going to mention a couple things that we talk about, and and a lot of this does actually kind of both grow out of the national broadband plan, but the work of lots of other people that we were trying to pull together. But um, uh, in education, for example. One of the ideas that I would really love to, if we could get a consensus on would be to abolish state textbook um, boards. There's about 30 states that have them. Textbooks uh, are obsolete. They're not nearly as effective in conveying information as new technology. And, and, and frankly, I think it'd be a wonderful thing if the federal government would use its levers to make sure that five years from now we don't have state textbook adoption boards because we actually don't want state textbooks. What we want is the communication of e-content. Um, we want faster, cheaper, better education. Uh, there are a number of ways in which the government can remove barriers to that happening. Um, there was a wonderful story on the cover of Forbes magazine about Salman Khan and the Khan Academy talking about the literally trillion dollar opportunity. Um, uh, of course, Forbes, as it should, was talking about the opportunity to make money. Uh, but what's really fascinating is the opportunity to have much better education at a much cheaper price. I'm not justly sure I agree with the person from the Gates Foundation who said we can give everyone uh, in the world a great high school education for $100 a year, but I do agree with the principle that that would be A, a great thing, and B, at a minimum, if we could improve everybody's education, as we clearly could uh, with this technology for $100 a year, we'd be getting a lot more for our money. So the book goes into that. Uh, well, one of my favorite ideas from the book um, I stole from Bruce. Uh, Bruce who will be introduced later, heads of a group called the High Tech CEO Coalition. Uh, they noted that they had a report that suggested a trillion dollars in savings, I believe, over a 10-year period. Uh, if the government were to accelerate, essentially, the transition to the what we th might think of as the e-platform or the digital platform. And what Reed and I did was we said, we think that's a great idea, uh, but the way to make it work is uh, have Congress pass a law that creates a commission that has, essentially, base closing commission uh, powers have it do the study, make a series of recommendations for which there's an up and down vote, allow the savings to be utilized to purchase equipment early on. Uh, government, of course, the federal government, one of the few organizations in the world that doesn't have a CapEx budget, uh, so you sometimes have to do things like this, but uh, allow those savings to be used um, uh, in part to buy equipment uh, and accelerate the change. I also think, and this is where maybe there wouldn't be a consensus in the room, some of the savings ought to be used for universal adoption because if we want to have government only be on the digital platform, we're going to have to get everybody else on too, as well as some job training because jobs will be lost and we think that's important. Um, so that, that's another idea. Let me just close by saying that I'm an American exceptionalist, but I think it has to be earned exceptionalism. We earn it by leading. The world is going through a change from the manipulation or economy characterized by the manipulation of atoms to one characterized by delivering goods and services through bits, chips, and bandwidth. This is inevitable. It's absolutely inevitable. And as a friend of mine who's a kind of a legendary Texas hedge fund owner, um, told me before he shorted the subprime market making $500 million. He said, look, this is inevitable, and if you want to be successful, you just own the inevitable. In the same way, I think the United States ought to accelerate the inevitable, and we ought to own it. And if America can lead the world in the delivery of bandwidth goods and services, I think that will uh, accomplish the subtitle in the book, because it will fix the budget, revise the American dream, and establish Obama's legacy. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Blair. Thanks very much. <clears throat>